Next, from the Union League Club of Chicago, former Attorney General Ty Fanner, who now heads the Civic Committee of the Commercial Club of Chicago, talks about the urgent need to cut the cost of state pensions. This runs about 50 minutes. Uh, I'm very, Chris, thanks very much, and Guy, I'm very pleased to be here today uh, to discuss pension reform. Uh, I, I, uh, I know that back when the Civic Committee started this in 2006, under the, um, you know, uh, Facing Facts campaign headed by Jim Farrell at the time, uh, who was th in the Civic Committee retired chairman of ITW, it was Union League Club that, that backed us way back then, and that you've been working on, you were an original member of the so-called Illinois is Broke campaign, and uh, you've continued to work on pressing the need for pension reform and budgetary reform, and so you've been a wonderful and strong partner, and hopefully what will come out of this morning will be uh, e e another recharge in terms of adv advocacy, because I think that's the only thing, sooner or later, that'll get it done. Uh, as I say, the Civic Committee's involvement began in 2006, and in 2006, the unfunded pension liability, it was more than pension liability, uh, uh, the Civic Committee looked at where the state was headed, and it wasn't in a good direction, and uh, used the, the substantial resources of the committee, much, most of which are pro bono contributions by the members, uh, uh, and, and looked and said, well, among other things, we are $35 billion in 2006 upside down on the funding of our pensions. And if you don't do something about it, it's gonna be a serious problem, but here's how you can, how you can fix it. Uh, nothing was fixed, nothing was addressed, nothing was done. And so now uh, we are $97 billion in that short period of time uh, unfunded in our pension liability. On top of that is a $53 billion unfunded um, uh, healthcare liability. Now the pension liability is protected uh, in a variety of ways, the healthcare is not. We are the only state in the union that, uh, and let me, let me just stop because this is gonna sound like a harangue and an attack on public employees and teachers and so forth. It's not, it, isn't, it is intended to be extremely critical and an attack upon union leadership in all of those places because uh, uh, they're the ones who have, have drug their feet and refused to deal how things were. But Illinois is the, the only state in the union as represented by that $54 billion unfunded pension, a health care liability that pays full health care for its membership. Other states provide health care for their public employees, but it's usually a third or a half or with contributions. Not Illinois, we do it all and we do it for their families too. It's unsustainable, it never should have been allowed. Um, this goes back years and crosses all the political lines, but between those things, um, we are in, in just terrible, terrible shape, as you know. And that along, those two things, along with the growing problems of Medicaid, even though they cut out a answer of that uh, last year, has taken us to the bottom of the heap with respect to other states. Now, to give you a brief idea, and I do have to look at my notes here because I pulled these to be factually correct, uh, where the state uh, is in terms of, of, of uh, how we're counted among other states, you, most of you know this, we have the worst bond rating in the country from Standard & Poor's and Moody's and the second worst from Fritch, the Fitch ratings with a negative outlook from all three agencies. And you all observed, I believe, uh, a few weeks ago now when, when uh, they withdrew a, uh, a bond issue because of the, the state of things and it would have been uh, such expensive money, it just, it just didn't seem right and it wasn't going to go so they pulled it back before catastrophe hit, at least public catastrophe. And so nobody wants our paper, and I wouldn't blame them. I wouldn't put that in my pension fund. Uh, we rank second in the country in terms of citizens leaving the state. Uh, according to a group called the National Tax Foundation, Illinois lost over $20 billion in taxable income from 2000 to 2010. Uh, we all know that from the census. We know it from our loss of members of our con congressional delegation. As, as people leave, you get less, uh, but we are, uh, we are losing people, we're losing people because we're losing jobs, we're losing jobs because of, of, of the uh, awful way in which we govern a state. Uh, not just unfunded pension liability, but the uh, same as on a national level, the unequal tax treatment, it's foolish, you need substantial tax reform here, you need to get back and, and do 
uh, simple basic things. This is neither intended to be Republican or Democrat. I hope you'll accept it that way, because when I'm in this role, I'm, I'm not a Republican. I'm for the Civic Committee, and it's a bipartisan, nonpartisan group. But our workman's compensation was improved that much uh, a year ago. It still costs, uh, uh, it, it is one-sixth one sixth as expensive to do business in terms of workman's compensation in Indiana as it is in Illinois. It, I, we had Governor Mitch Daniels come speak to the commercial club some time ago, and he laid that out. So we're, we're just awful in terms of our hospitality to, hospitality to business. Our average uh, in unemployment is 8.9%. It's the nine, ninth highest in the nation and higher than our neighboring states. Uh, it's likely, it's not unlikely, it, it's unlikely to improve any time in the near future because our business climate overall is rated one of the very worst in the country. We're 48th in the nation according to the most recent CEO magazine ranking the best and worst states for business. These are the people that decide, do we bring business here, keep business here, or pull business out of here? And many of you may have heard uh, Mr. Ober Oberhelman uh, from Caterpillar, who said that he would never build another facility here, and, and struggled only with keeping the headquarters in Peoria, which he did out of respect for the town and for the many people that have served Caterpillar well over the years. Uh, we're, we're 46th by the U.S. Chamber of Commerce in terms of the fairness and reasonableness of our, our lawsuit climate, i.e. tort reform. We're 35th by the Small Business and Entrepreneurship Council based on our attractiveness to small business and, and, and uh, entrepreneurs. I was talking to uh, Mr. Roth, Monroe Roth, just beforehand, who reminded me that he had been involved years ago in, as part of a group that provided uh, advice and access, and, and he's, he's seated right back there, uh, to, to small business as well. Um, we're not thought very well. The list goes on and on. Uh, in, in the midst of all this bad news, there are some positive signs. Uh, due to the many efforts, the efforts of many public uh, bodies and, and groups such as yours uh, to address the pension crisis, uh, I think we're, we're really close. Someone said, are we going to get it this, this spring? Uh, the answer is, I hope so. We'll come back to that in the Q&A if it makes sense. But news and opinion pieces about pension reform appear on a regular basis across all the state's news media. The Chicago Tribune, this is not a commercial, I bought the paper for years, and uh, uh, delivered to our home in Evanston, and, and uh, it's, it's a wonderful paper, always has been. They have led the fight on this uh, in terms of exposing uh, not only the, the state of affairs, but some of the true abuses that have occurred. And that keeps the public spotlight on the people that govern in Springfield in the, in the legislature. Uh, pension reform was one of the key issues in recent statewide elections. Uh, a good example of that is it, it, everyone was running on pension reform, and it was kind of laughable to read the endorsements and their platforms because I'd had conversations in person with most of these people in the last two years. Uh, and they would, most of them were in your face saying, You're not a problem, you never missed a payment, not going to happen, get real. But then they ran, campaigned on pension reform. I don't have a lot of confidence that they will change their their minds, I think the leadership will. But the good news is there are 22 new legislators who decided uh, to not accept or not participate in this, the state uh, pension system for members of the General Assembly, and I think that's a positive move. It's, it's a public rebuke of what the General Assembly hasn't done. In all of this, it's kind of silly because the, none of these systems are funded well or adequately. Uh, it's 39 or 38 percent average, depending on who's counting and what day. The General Assembly is like 18% funded. I guess they're not worried about getting theirs, uh, but they are, they're not funding themselves. More importantly, we're starting to see a number of pension proposals uh, put forward by members of the General Assembly. And I'm going to fast forward here and just talk about a couple as a point of reference. There are two, there are two bills down there that are talked about most. People are putting in their own versions, which don't have any chance of consideration, but people like to introduce bills and say that they're for pension reform. There's Senate Bill 1, which is uh, introduced by Senator Cullerton. Uh, I refer to it as a, the Cullerton Bill, and in his proposal is actually a dual proposal, uh, that he would uh, uh, pension reform, but it would only save, uh, I think, 16 or $18 billion over a 30-year period. 
And, and the, the, the fatal flaw with that besides the lack of savings is that it would take the health care that I was talking about and, and it would be so-called consideration. The, the theory is that if, if you're entitled to something, you give it up, just like in basic contract law, well, there's you know, offered acceptance, you get something for what you give up. Uh, it, it, in the context of, um, of the whole pension topic, that's a false argument. It's been an excuse for a long time, uh, and we, we could spend the morning uh, as lawyers talking about that. Uh, and uh, I can only tell you it's not my opinion, but uh, Supreme Court and Appellate Counsel from Sidley and Austin, Mayor Brown, uh, and now most recently um, Kirkland and Ellis through their ROMs, through the Mayor's Corporate Counsel, uh, called Senator Cullerton and said, there's no consideration needed. That's not what the law says. We know that. We knew it before. Anyway, Senator Cullerton had been a strong opponent of pension reform, and it's not hard to, this, it's not hard to understand because that's where a lot of his votes come from and his members. Uh, he, he is currently, uh, and this is one of the hopeful signs, at least privately, uh, and, and I don't mean secretly, but privately, understands fully what's going on, and, and uh, I believe by not calling that bill, he's had that bill out there, uh, but uh, it would lock in, it would lock in the, the $54 billion for health care besides the 97 that would have to be dealt with. And I see, you know, we talked, and, and he has not pushed that. He's got it out there for whatever reason. And he's actually in private, uh, and I believe in conversations, I would bet, uh, with, with uh, Speaker Madigan and, and uh, Tom Cross, Christine Rodonio, I think they are trying to find the way, and I think the way is the, what well, we've shorthanded at the Civic Committee, the NBC bill, Neckritz, Biss, and Cross. And, and Elaine Neckritz is a, a Democratic representative from the Northwest suburbs, and she's terrific. And she's a, she was assigned to do the, do the pension business on behalf of the Speaker Madigan. Uh, she got out front on it a year ago. Um, the uh, unions went after her, the teachers' unions in her district, just to be clear, and she'll tell you that. And um, she had a safe district drawn safe that she won with extreme plurality, and the unions went after her. And, and uh, uh, actually, a number of members of the Civic Committee uh, Rock solid Republicans gave her contributions. We threw a fundraiser for her, and she was retained in office. Uh, but the point is this, that that's what members are afraid of. They're afraid of the unions coming up and beating them up, and that's why they, they don't have the nerve or the ability or the, or the strength of conviction to, to change their ways. Tom Cross, Elaine Neckritz, and a young man named Daniel Biss. He is a, uh, uh, was a math professor at U of C. Uh, brilliant young guy. Uh, and the three of them have put together a bill which would be the kind of bill that would solve, substantially solve the, the, the pension problems in, in a meaningful way. It's gotten 31 legislators uh, to sign on, a Democrat and Republican. Uh, what the bill does, it will reduce the existing $97 billion unfunded liability by an estimated $30 billion over, the, over a 30-year arc and will reduce, importantly, the state's annual contribution, pension costs, through these reforms. What that means, basically, is to fund the pensions as we are right now. It takes about $5.1 billion where we are as of today. Another $2 billion, 2.2 actually, goes to uh, pay down some of the unfunded liability and to pay the, the costs connected with the pension borrowings. It isn't just uh, it isn't just the unfunded liability. They borrowed money to keep the pensions in, even at the level they're at, and the, the tax increase was passed a few years ago. It went entirely, it was supposed to pay the bills to the state, it didn't. It went entirely to the pension funds. But what it means is if this passes, you'd, Senator Cullerton, Speaker Madigan, and the rest would have $2 billion a year that could be put back into education, health care, uh, special needs children, uh, police health and safety and fire needs, all the things that are being drained uh, by our current situation. And it has a lot of technical requirements. I, I won't go through them, and it, you can go through them later if you like. But it, it basically puts limits on the cost of living. Cost of living has been compounded annually at 3%. And so, uh, you know, the Tribune has pointed this out with great clarity. You have people uh, who can retire uh, at 55 and uh, uh, and have a $160,000 pension for the rest of their life. And we're living a long time right now, and there are a lot of those people out there. There are 600,000 people in this state 
uh, either currently working or on state pensions. And so if you work the math, that's why we're, where we are. It puts a, uh, a, a it, it, an important part of this is that the employees have to contribute an additional 2% uh, of their pay toward their pensions. And, and there are other things. Once again, it's, it, I don't want to get into the weeds. I'd rather talk about the larger issues. It does have one very controversial position, uh, in, at least in terms of the Civic Committee and, and a lot of people. It provides for a guarantee that the pension payments will be made. Now, only one other state in the country has a guarantee that their pension payments will be made. It's a little hard intellectually to understand, but that's what the status of things it, it would be. Without that guarantee that the we got into the spot we're in, among other things, because uh, Governor Blagojevich and, uh, and others took pension holidays. It was, this isn't just a blame it all on Blagojevich. This has been a, a, a problem coming for years. But uh, the fact is that they've never been funded fully. Uh, when, when back in 1970 they had a constitutional convention, it was all going to be different. It hasn't been. They were 40% funded then. They're 39% funded now. And this is where the unions, in my judgment, the members is a better way to put it, have it right because every two weeks they pay into their pension a certain amount of money. That amount of money is to be matched by the state. That only been intermittently when it was convenient. Uh, and, and that's why the state funding is there now. Uh, and so uh, people of a conservative bent such as mine uh, say, well, you know, why in the hell would you want to? The guarantee would give preference to, to uh, all the other needs of the state theoretically after the bonding it would be then you, you then you put in the pensionable amount but then again if you think about it intellectually and, and not as republican or a democrat or as a liberal or a conservative um, as i've been trying to explain to some of my my colleagues who don't quite agree yet i don't quite understand what the problem is with guarantee that you'll do what you're already obligated to do and so you're not really giving those people anything other than the promise that you'll do what you hadn't done in the past that you should have done in the past and so it gets a little bit muddy uh, but I do know one thing for sure, and without that contract provision in, which is something that the unions are insisting upon and the Democrats on the bill, and, and uh, there will not be a pension bill. And so those people who want to, you know, talk about it in a, in a different frame of reference, uh, if you will, uh, I say, look, you know, uh, either, either you have this in or you don't have the votes. Do you, do you want to give people what they're entitled to? And it's not a radical thought. I mean, they've earned it and they've paid their part. The people, the contributions that go to health care, that go to police and fire, those folks have jobs, but they're not putting money in. These people, every two weeks, whether it's a member of AFSCME or a teacher's union or anything else, are putting their bucks in and they're entitled to have it back. I think if that provision stays in there, that'll break the log jam to help get this done. I know that Senator Cullerton feels very strongly about it. Um, I won't stand here and tell you that I know what Speaker Madigan, I believe he feels strongly about it too, but as everyone says he doesn't tell you what he's thinking. Uh, he's been very forthcoming with me. Uh, we've, he's never lied to me on behalf of these efforts, and I have great confidence that, that I think we're in a position now where if the public pressure stays on this and, and the media, uh, the Tribune's been doing it, and the uh, Sun-Times has even gotten on board. Uh, I'll do a quick digression. I was getting beat up by a woman I won't identify her who's on the editorial board of the Sun-Times. Uh, a few weeks ago about about our bill, about their bill and the NBC bill. And uh, she said, no, you know, this isn't good enough. You got to do this and we should raise taxes. You got to do that. And uh, we're going back and forth. And I was trying to, I'm German, I'm not Irish, uh, but I, I do have a tough streak and I was getting pretty upset, but I found out with the press, they'll write what they want anyway. And so thank God the Tribune gets it right. This lady, uh, is beating the hell out of me, literally, and getting very aggressive. And I finally, I said, look, and I won't tell you her name because she's a nice young woman and it's all how you, where you come from. Uh, I said, uh, do you have a pension? Silence. Um, no, I don't. I said, why? She says, because it sometimes went bankrupt. I said, do you get it? That's what this is about. It's about, <laughs> I, I said, it's about saving the pensions for these people. And, and, uh, and, and, and they have new ownership and, and, uh, of the Tribune, and I think they're trying to revive what was once an excellent paper. Um, but swear it is. There's so, much, there's so much emotion around all of this. Uh, uh, I, I think that um, if, if people get along with this consideration, you don't need consideration by giving them health care, but I think it's perfectly logical, fair, and reasonable 
to put a, a, uh, uh, a provision in this pension bill that will tell people they'll get what they're already entitled to. I don't find that harsh or dramatic or, or, or progressive or liberal or anything else. It's kind of common sense. So uh, uh, I, I'm not responsible for the gathering storm. The storm has been here uh, for a long, long time. Uh, but it was sure a, an eye opener, and uh, uh, we've had tremendous help and support uh, from you. I hope it'll continue, uh, and uh, so I'm going to stop on that. And I would welcome questions because I, you know, I, I just would like to tell you what you want to hear about. But thank you very much. Hi. Right. Thank you, Ty. Okay, so this part of the program belongs to you. Just. Give me a wave or a wink, something. We'll start with Robert Fitzgerald. Uh, I'll come up. I'll hold the microphone. Just stand, introduce yourself, and then please state your question. Thank you. Uh, at the end of the day, if the legislature and the powers that be fail to address this problem, isn't it going to take a constitutional convention to address it? And where does the Civic Committee stand on that? We. Uh, uh, the Civic Committee is about 90 members that run the biggest companies, and we're, we're not a monolithic group, so to, to say where I, th I'll say where I think that the majority would be, maybe all of them, I don't know. We hadn't thought about a constitutional convention. We, we, we talk at our meetings and our resources in terms of what happens if this isn't fixed, and what happens if it isn't fixed is that uh, uh, the, the final step with respect to our bond rating will occur. And, uh, and all sorts of bad things will happen, uh, not, not the fake bad things, as we hear about from Washington all the time. Forgive my commentary, I can't help myself. Uh, but we really won't be able to pay our bills. And even more so than now, because as you know, we're billions of dollars uh, unfunded. I don't know if a constitutional convention would do it. You really need to have the leadership and the individual people that have run for office and made a promise to you and what they're gonna do for us, not just for them, they have an entire constituency to, to, to hold them to it. So I found out in the last couple of years that, that many members of the Civic Committee, uh, many members of the public don't even know who the hell the representative or senator is. And, and so you have to engage yourself uh, to do that. It would take, it would take uh, I, I, th I think that we don't have the time to have a constitutional con convention and, and to fix things and write things, because that was actually attempted back in 1970. And uh, uh, was supposed to have, have addressed this pension issue, and it did not. But I, we haven't thought about it, to be honest with you, Gerald. We just haven't thought of it. Okay. Introduce yourself. Tom Healy. Uh, given the parade of horribles that you've laid before us, and if the Civic Committee believes that the NBC bill is the right vehicle to move forward, what should the business community be doing to take this issue to the public? Because so far, we've relied primarily on the Tribune to carry the banner. Uh, but what is it that the business community should be doing now? Well, that was kind of a setup because Tom's a, a friend and colleague. He asked me that beforehand, and I said, do, do me a favor, ask that when you have the Q&As. And so, uh, but, but it's a setup because, I, I, I mean, it's going to make some of you think, what the hell is he talking about? The business community uniformly, partially but not uniformly, has not gotten behind this. Uh, they talk about it, but when we, even some of the biggest companies uh, uh, that, are, that are involved that have paid lobbyists for their, their, their needs in Springfield, um, they haven't engaged it. Why? Um, because the business community, you know, some of these companies have shareholders, and so they're not going to go out and tell Speaker Maddox or Senator Cullerton or union interest, to be blunt, that you better do this, this, or this, or else, because then their program on something they need for their company uh, you know, we'll get the, the same treatment, which is none, and they're not good treatment. So there's been a lot of cowardice on behalf of the business community. We, we, uh, uh, we got some of the major organizations and principal members of the commercial club uh, together. We're going to do it again uh, next Monday, uh, March 11th. I think the, the, the push to get this to completion uh, is, is to get, get some sort of a good pension bill like the Necrits Bis and Cross Bill soon. But, you know, whether you're a small business person or a big business person, what really works uh, is when you call your legislator and say, um, you know, um, if you want my support, maybe you've never given them a nickel, but you're, you're going to tell them that, you, that if they want your support or your vote, which should be more important, or financial assistance, you better get on board on this, and, and you need to do it now. 
I, I think that's working because last year, just before the last election cycle, and I, I've got to be careful here because actually there, I don't want to demonize anyone. People can make their own determinations on what hasn't been done, whether it's Republican or Democratic leadership or individual. But uh, um, when, uh, when members of the General Assembly were going around to the, some of the bigger companies uh, asking for their uh, financial support for their candidacy, uh, uh, I, I can tell you that, uh, uh, well, uh, Miles White is, is the CEO of Abbott, and he's kind of a direct guy. And he told a couple of people who came in that Abbott had been giving support to that, that uh, to get the hell out of his office, don't ask for anything until they pass pension bill and come back and talk about other things. And he said, whatever we need from you, we need this pension stuff more. Lester Crown, Crown Industries, wonderful man. Um, one of the most generous giving people I've ever met in my life to philanthropy, to, 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 to Elaine Neckridge, to good political causes. He didn't use Miles' language. He's, he's a lot, he has a different approach, but he basically said, well, thanks for coming, but no, you're not going to get any support until you pass pension bill. Uh, Jim Farrell, who started this Facing Facts, the former uh, uh, sits on a number of the boards around the city, still has quite a, a personal and political and philanthropic following, and people came to him, and, and he was very direct and said he was sickened by the lack of inaction on all concerned. Well, guess what? Now we have... 22 new legislators who won't take their pension. We have 31 Republicans and Democrats standing up with, you know, bis cross. I think they, they realize that the time is up. So to that point, to those of you who know who your, your elected representative or senator is, you know, you don't have to bang the table or, or anything like that. Just call them and tell them how important it is to your community and to this city and to the state. Uh, one of the things beforehand, one of the conversations, someone was t mentioned Detroit. I, I grew up on Detroit, on the east side uh, of Detroit, as a young person. It was a, a, a clean, safe, blue-collar town. Um, my uh, folks were both union members. My mom, Michigan Bell, my dad, 44 years at Chrysler. I'm the first one in my family to go to college and graduate, so I'm not anti-union. It provided, put bread on the table. But the union leadership has been just obstructive. Uh, if you followed it in the papers, um, uh, Speaker Madigan it went after them and said that he'd had enough of that. And these are the same people that, that provide the money and support for his caucus, for him and for his caucus. But he said, enough's enough. You've got to look after the state. Senator Cullerton's done the same thing. Tom Cross has been, has been doing that for some time. And the biggest thing, and I'm sorry this is such a long answer, because it's all about the feelings down there, the dynamics and the need that we have nowhere else to go now. The bonds suck. We're broke. We can't get any broker. We spent two years talking to these same people, and they said, you know, you're joking. There's not a problem. I mean, that's what they said. I and mean, that's why the Illinois is broke deal, the proof of people we were really broke. We've never missed a pension payment. You're lying about, about the state of affairs, and we're not worried about it. Uh, so I guess, you know, call, call the people that you can affect, or if you have friends that are connected with them in one fashion, or they call them and say, well, you get these people off their behind. The essential time is right now. If this gets drug out to... Um, Memorial Day, the last day, it'll be caught up with uh, concealed carry, uh, with uh, uh, gay marriage rights, with uh, casinos, with uh, I don't know what else down there, but all the stuff that these guys and ladies busy themselves with and use as an excuse. Then it gets to the vote trade and it would be dead. So make the calls now, Tom, and all the rest of you, if, if you're willing. If you don't know who your representative or that is, it's real easy to find, or just call over to the Civic Committee. We'll tell you you know, who to call and, and, and what to do. But thank you for that question. And now, Scott Stantis. Um, I mean, you, you touched on it, <clears throat> pardon me, on your answer, but the unions are the, the sticking point here. I mean, Cullerton, Madigan both came out strongly publicly about this, but you touched on it earlier on your comments that what these guys, the elected officials, are scared to death of, especially now that we have a overwhelmingly democratic legislature, is the unions. How do you get these guys on board? Because they seem adamant about any reasonable kind of legislation to address this issue. Yes, yeah, Scott, they, they, uh, they were adamant against it. They're adamant against it now, but I'm talking about the union leadership, and I think that, and it was a lesson for me to learn, but you have to separate out the members from their, their leadership. And we, we've spent the last year or so going directly to, uh, to teachers, um, not one-on-one, -on -one, but to groups saying, 
this is what's at stake. And, and I could ask any of you here, if you have a son or a daughter or you yourself have started in the uh, teaching profession, whether it's at uh, the um, uh, primary level or high school or indeed with a university, uh, if, you're a new, if you're a new teacher within six years or newer, unless this is fixed, you don't have a, a chance in hell to get a single nickel of the money back you're putting in every two weeks. And, and we, uh, because we're, we're, we're a, the Civic Committee tries to be a constructive organization, I'm a lawyer, I'm a trial lawyer, that's how I'm in my living, and, and you deal with you know, advocacy and controversy. And uh, we just decided it was the wrong thing to do. But uh, uh, you, could, you could actually um, file a civil rights lawsuit in the federal court. Uh, if you get past a motion to dismiss, you'd be successful because we, you can prove economically that without a change, these people that are putting their money in are doing with no hope of getting it back. It's, it's the worst kind of scam. Uh, it's, it's taking money to false pretenses. The whole system is bankrupt now. Uh, you know, uh, there's, there's a lot of controversial law on whether a, uh, the state can't go bankrupt, but the teacher's retirement system can go bankrupt because it is not a state agency. It's a group of people that pay in and so forth. So, uh, you know, we, we, we are pounding on the union leadership and that's what the papers and the statewide, I mean, the first few days there was just a, a, a small bunch of clips, but every single day now, I mean, I, when we started this, you'd have clips from the major newspapers throughout the state every single day talking about pension reform, who's losing, the person, the little old lady out on the street down in Marion because they've been crowded out because pension funds, uh, the people who have autistic children whose funds have been yanked and aren't getting the help they need now. So, you know, you separate it, and the only way you can do it is to go to the membership, but I do think, uh, and I mean this as a compliment, they, they, no matter what else we, we blame people for, me, others, um, Speaker Madigan, Senator Cullerton, Senator Redonio, and Tom Cross, I think are the leaders now that can change this because they do run their caucuses. I think they're that close, and uh, if they get the, the, the support, uh, not, not for what hasn't happened, how we got here, but how do we fix it, they're the key, and they're the sole key. And, and the governor, uh, in, in truth, uh, and this is not a paid political announcement, he's, he's, a, he's a good, caring guy, but he will support anything. He wants us behind him, and so it's really hard to get his focused attention. Uh, uh, and and, he, and the, the leaders, this is not secret stuff, the four leaders I've talked about, the Democrats in particular, and the governor don't really talk to each other. They're not in sync. They don't, they don't even care for each other. So that's part of the problems. But, I'm sorry, Chris, I'm going to be so long. Uh, Monroe Roth, Mr. Fainer, you were talking about contacting operatives. I do know who they are, Sarah Fagot Holtz and, and Mr. Cullerton, and I talked to them, and I have said to them, if you don't do something, I won't vote for you. And they're, they could care less. Who am I going to vote for if I don't vote for them? My friend here, who is a Republican born and bred. No, I, I was raised a Democrat. <laughs> there is. There, there, there isn't anybody to oppose either of those people or at least anybody else in the city of Chicago or the county of Cook. How do you get that changed? Uh, it, the, the change it would be, I, I don't know the answer you have. We always have to listen more carefully to people that are running for office and hold them to what they say, and that hasn't been done, Mr. Roth. But the, the fact is, um, where the game is right now, in, in the here and now, is to really work on an, an appeal to the leadership abilities and qualities of, of uh, Cullerton and Madigan and Cross and, and, uh, and Redonio. That's the best we can do for right now. Just a quick question. Um, I'm Brian Castle, member of the club. Um, is, the, is the proposal a defined benefit proposal or a defined contribution proposal? The, the, the uh, proposal that's out there now would have a, a combination defined benefit and defined contribution so that the, the uh, the, the traditional benefit that has put us kind of in the spot we're in has been this defined benefit. And to put, so much of this is to put votes on. So it's not a perfect bill, but it's a good bill. And, and it, would, it would be a combination for new employees, one rule for prior, for existing employees, a combination of divine benefit and divine contribution. Uh, it has the desired economic uh, uh, portion. You put votes on by leaving some guarantee of what you'll have in there. That's the other irony is none of these folks really want to, that's not true, the, the, the defined contribution, we're all at risk. 
brand new, brand new record yesterday. I can look at my 401k and I'll be really happy today. I worry about tomorrow right now and that's part of the risk, but it's a combination right now. And, and, uh, and it's, it's not a bad idea, candidly, uh, the way it, it presently sits, but they don't want to deal with their own. All of a sudden they've had things promised and guaranteed. Now they have nothing. So that's where we are. Yes, it is. Yeah, defined contribution will be a portion of what it is. They'll still have a small portion if this bill passes of a defined benefit, but it'll be substantially less than what they had before. It won't break the bank. I, I, I don't understand. Oh, I'm Frank Russell. I, I don't understand your point about the guarantee. Is that, I mean, that's a requirement. They say it's drop dead if we don't get the guarantee. I don't, I don't understand that. Well, it, it's, be, it's because... It's because of the rhetoric so far that the, in, a, in a complaint that if in fact you, you uh, pass it without a guarantee, you won't get what you're promised. But the other thing is this consideration notion. I kind of smooched them together. For the last two years, Senator Cullerton has a young lawyer named Eric Madeer, a fine young guy, wrote an 81 page tome on you can't take anything away. When, when, we, when, I, when I took my job, I'm guaranteed these benefits for life. If you change them, it's unconstitutional. That's nonsense because there's a provision in the Constitution which says, all of this is subject to the, it, we call it uh, police and fire, police fire safety. But it basically says the needs of anything, of anyone, uh, are trumped when it comes to providing the basic needs of society, which is health, education, police and fire safety. That provision's still in. The, uh, but, but what we've tried to convince, because I think it's valid, uh, is to take this health care consideration piece out that Cullert was talking about and his people, and give them something that their members, the, 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 the people that support them, have not had before, which is a guarantee that right after the bonding obligations the state are cared for, and that's always, you can't sell anything if you don't have that as number one. But you put their, their pension payments, the matching payments, if you will, of what they've already put in next to it, that'll be guaranteed. Uh, 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 that's something they want. Um, they're, Well, this is the, I welcome you to go to Springfield with me because logic doesn't, it, it's, it's, it's. And now, 8.45, it's, it's, we it's, get the whole story. No, it, it, truthfully, and I, and I don't, I, I, you guys pull a plug whenever you, you need to or want to. The, the, the fact is, you deal with a combination. You, you have to have a good, solid plan. There has to be something in it but you have to put the votes on, and that's the reality. And so you have to give people things. Sometimes they're not even entitled to them, sometimes they are. But if you can't do that, then we fall back to where we are. And you're right, I mean, if, see, and, and I think that's what finally has, candidly, uh, Mr. Russell has, has, has um, I don't know if frightens the right word, but has gotten the leadership. They won't admit it in a tribune or anything else, but they finally look and say, holy crap, we've got a budget that we can't, we, 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 we have these unfunded bills, we can't fund our needs at all. And it, with our bonding, we're, we're about ready to implode. And so um, they're putting the votes on right now. And I can just tell you that it, it's an imperfect bill, but it's a damn good bill. It's much better than we were talking about before and the very fact that some of the members, which is an important point, all of them will limit under this bill of their COLAs. It won't be 3% compounded every year. It'll be uh, 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 only a COLA up to the first $25,000 of, of, of your pension. And uh, they're contributing money, 2%. They, they didn't contribute anything before. So to get that, you got to give something back. But um, uh, it's, it's really about the mechanics. I mean, when we started this two years ago, and I thought everything was going to be easier, I, I actually met with the speaker and Senator Cullerton and the other two leaders in the speaker's office once a week. And we were trying to hash out a bill that would work. And, and, and Madigan would quite probably say, he said, Ty, that's great. You're right. But we, I can't put the votes on. No matter, no matter what you think I can do, I can't put the votes on. So it's, it's a trade-off. Uh, it, it is a head shaker. It doesn't make any appreciable sense. But we, we uh, I guess going back to the question Mr. Roth asked, if we can get beyond this particular crisis, get a, a bill passed, that'll free up so many other things. We can get back to a real budget, pay our bills. So many things could happen, all positive, if you fix the pension mess. Then maybe you go back and try and let a hand of a person that'll actually go down there and do what they say. I have to make this point, too. Uh, because this, this is an equal opportunity talk, and uh, I couldn't figure out why we couldn't put, I'm a Republican, uh, you know, and this, as I said, in my role in the Civic Committee, I'm not, but that's how I, and, and so I went to Leader Cross and, and, and Speaker Redonio, and I've said this to their faces, it's not an attempt to 
to submarine. Anything I'm saying here, I, I've said to them already, and, 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 I, and I, once again, they're all on the right side of this issue now. But I couldn't figure out why the Republicans couldn't put the 30 damn votes on in the, in the caucus to go to Madigan and say, I've got my 30, where's yours? And finally, um, we couldn't figure out why the influence. The influence is you can look at your legislator, uh, remove this last election, maybe a little different, but before this last election back, the unions, the Illinois Education Association, Illinois Federation of Teachers, uh, 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 asked me to a lesser degree, have all given money. I won't, I, I could use the hard word that they've greased, these leaders, but they've all contributed to their election deal. And the, the implication is, I'll give you money, but if you don't, you know, they won't get money, I'll crush you. I'll give it to the guy that's gonna run against you. And, and I'm talking not about 5,000, I'm talking about 10, 15, 20, thousand twenty five thousand dollar contributions from one source for a, a a state legislative race and it was uniform it was hard to find anyone that hadn't and uh, 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 you know one person I was having a dispute with the other day of the Republican Party I uh, and, and his friend uh, at least consider him that I don't know if he does me anymore but we were having some hard conversation about this and uh, uh, he volunteered as we're ending up on satisfactory and he says you just think I'm bought because I got $25,000 from the IEA. That is not true. And I said, well, it wasn't on my mind, buddy, but if it's on yours, maybe you are. <laughs> and and this, I swear to God, you're, you can't make this stuff up. But that's, that's the problem. So now everybody, once again, I'm, I'm not throwing, I'm not selling, I sold the Detroit News as a boy, I'm not selling the Tribune. Uh, but these guys have done a spectacular job. They get whatever the, re the awards are when we get this done because the exposure of all of this has made the difference in, in you know, the transparency of it. So anyway, that's, that's the best I can do. And I apologize for that. Uh, Mr. Fair, Dave Cohn, Director of Public Affairs at the club. I wanted to say, first of all, for any members of the Union League Club who would like, to help, uh, uh, like some help identifying their state reps and state senators, we'd be delighted to help you with that. Uh, the Public Affairs Office will look that up for you right away. Uh, I have a question about uh, a sort of whether or not you agree that we, we to a certain extent that we we have a structural problem with our legislature in dealing with these kinds of intractable issues. And I'm referring specifically to the 1980 cutback amendment that our current governor engineered, uh, which reduced the size of the Illinois legislature. Uh, I had the great privilege of working for 15 years for uh, Congressman John Porter, who before he went to the U.S. House served in Springfield under that system. And he and many others have suggested that under that multi-member House system, uh, the, the leadership had lesser control, there was greater cooperation, there was greater uh, impetus to find consensus. And I'm wondering whether you agree that uh, part of our problem in dealing with things like the pension pr uh, crisis is the fact that we structurally have a legislature that is engineered to produce gridlock. Uh, I, I know that, uh, thank you for the question, I, 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 I will, do my best to answer that. I don't know the answer, but I do know that people like Senator Netsch, who we were talking about, uh, and a number of, of members of the General Assembly, Senator Rock, others uh, that have served down there when it was different, have, have had that viewpoint. And I think it makes sense. It certainly is harder to, uh, to control things if you have the setup that you've talked about. And uh, I think it was well intended um, at the time, but it, it, it has created gridlock. The, the, uh, where we are is clear as can be. I don't know if going back would change it, but it, it's the best idea I've, I've heard so far. Yes, sir. Uh, 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 Mr. Fainer, my name is Dan Kinsella. My question involves the guarantee. If there is such a guarantee, I think you referred to the fact that, and I didn't realize this, the fund itself could go bankrupt, even though the, uh, obviously the state cannot. Um, if there is such a guarantee, would that provide a priority um, for the creditors of the fund, meaning the beneficiaries, uh, uh, which could very well trump police, fire, public safety, uh, understand, uh, if a federal judge were to administer a bankruptcy. Yeah, the, the other, the, 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 you're exactly right if that were there standing alone, except that what is in this bill, along with the guarantee, which once again, not to overstate, is simply to say that after the bonding obligations are paid, then we will fund the pensions to the same extent that you put money in. The other part, which is in the law, which is consistent with the Illinois Constitution right now, is that it would not trump the police, fire, uh, and health care and education needs. So, uh, uh, and, and uh, this is not make it up as I go. I mean, we've had this, uh, these really great appellate lawyers, not trial lawyers who 
my wife always says I make things up. Uh, I don't think I do. But, uh, but these guys do not. And, and uh, uh, the, the, the truth is nothing will trump those basic needs. It, and it's in the U.S. Constitution, too. And, and this is going back to Mr. Russell's question. You know, okay, I get the part about you getting, I put in, you put in, that's kind of a deal. It, by the way, in the, in the private sector, if that were to happen, if you had a member that paid into their fund and you didn't, you'd go to jail. And this is a point that everybody's making for a long time. It's different for the state. So in a sense, it's, 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 a, it's a promise to give you what you're already entitled to. It does give you a priority second, but that priority, just to be clear, is trumped by other, other needs such, I don't want to get dramatic, but I mean, if, if we don't get things squared away uh, in this city in particular with the shootings and everything else, there's going to be a higher priority, not against the pensions, but the money gets moved around. But there, it, it, it's, it, hopefully you never get there because, uh, and, and the bankruptcy, I'm, I'm not, now I'm varying from the answer, uh, I, I've done the best I could on it, but one, there are a couple of people that have said, you know, to hell with these units, you can't trust them, they lie. Uh, the leadership have said that a little more gently, but you know what? Let them go bankrupt. Well, when you have all these people running for governor in both parties, that's not the answer to this. You can't let them go bankrupt because there are 600,000 people in the state, most of which who, who did this at a different time and God forbid they didn't know they're gonna live so long and their income is because of what they paid into their pension. And if you let these, these funds bankrupt, it has great appeal. You teach the union leadership of mention. Can you imagine what the state would be like if you had 600,000 people that couldn't pay their bills? I mean, we're, we're in, in, in the saddest of shape now. So we have to kind of restore it, make it hold, and get better, better stuff in there. All right, maybe, uh, maybe sometimes you've got to be irresponsible to be responsible. And uh, if a political solution really doesn't produce a favorable outcome, maybe you really need a market solution. And a market solution, I don't mean bankruptcy, I mean actually talking down the state's rating even further. So the state's bonds essentially become below investment grade. And it drives up the, bar the borrowing costs for the states and all of us to a significant level enough that you really feel the public pressure. I mean, that's somewhat irresponsible, but in the end, the rating agencies, they can lower sovereign debt. You can see Europe going through the same scramble, is that there has to be a market pressure that is overwhelming. And the market pressure is that our bonds that here they're, relate, they're, they're the 50th rated out of, out of 50 states, but it still haven't gone lower to the where they're actually below investment grade. Uh, the Civic Committee, not, not me, but me and some of the people that, uh, that make up the Civic Committee, some of the same names I mentioned before, uh, did meet with and call, uh, in, in one case it was an in-person meeting, I got a couple of calls to Moody's and Fitch and Center and Poor's and say, how in the hell can you guys do this? You know, you, you, you are, you're, you're an enabler to let the state continue. You keep threatening more and more and more. And I think now we've backed off because we don't want to be the, the straw that breaks the back. But if you watched what happened uh, over the last few years, it's been steadily down. But before that, it's been the blind eye, and that's a whole different topic, as you know, about how the rating agencies act and don't act. That's, that's more in your field and, and, and stuff. But it hasn't been irresponsible. We have told them uh, that we thought they were being irresponsible. And, uh, uh, but but we, we stopped that a couple months ago. I do know, I do know, that we, we suggested uh, that they talk to the governor and the governor's staff to see if he could give them comfort on where the state was going. And I think that's one of the reasons why we're really close now. I hope we're close. I'd hate to be back here, not, not that you'd invite me back, but if I were here a year from now, um, I, you know, I'd, I'd hate to say, gee, we tried again and we missed it. Uh, but uh, no, we've done all we could do on that. That it, it is responsible, but I think we don't, it would be irresponsible for the biggest employers of the state, which are who the civic committee is. I mean, you know, Abbott has 22,000 people, uh, ITW 26,000 in the state, and so forth and so forth, to go and basically inflict that on, on the people that work for them. So we're trying to work the political process. It, it's been an effective so far. Nobody knows how we've let it go so far or why we've let it go so far. It's, it's, it, uh, but uh, uh, I think, I, you know, once again, rattle the sabers and call everyone and tell them. I mean, you know, it's from you and, and, and from the standpoint of Kellogg, uh, uh, talk to Sally Blum about this. I said, you know, you ought to call these characters, invite them out and explain to one of your, your classes or, or one of your 
your groups at Kellogg how the hell they can do this. Um, so this is a place where maybe you could put some pressure. Let's thank Ty Fainer. You're watching the Illinois Channel, an independent nonprofit corporation formed to provide gavel-to-gavel -gavel coverage of Illinois state government and other public affairs events taking place across Illinois. 